All right, you magnificent bastard. You magnificent bastard. We're doing a top 10 most interesting bourbons. Yes, most unique, most interesting most bourbons. Most unique, yeah. We rarely do top 10 videos. And why? And yes, it, it, we've gone through this before, but the main reason is anytime somebody compiles their favorite top 10 list, whatever, it is so subjective and arbitrary. Yeah. And so we figured out a way around this. Well, and today, by the way, and also on top of that, mm. because the craft market is so huge now, yeah. there are people all over the U.S. doing really amazing things. You just can't get your hands on it. Okay. Because they don't have distribution. <laughs> so we had to pick things we could get our hands on, and we had to pick from a list we sourced right. from our whiskey tribe Yes. and so, our magnificent bastards. This isn't our two-bit opinion, and actually we added it up between the two of us. It's a four-bit opinion. That's right. So we have double the opinion value of most other people. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a crowdsource list of the top ten most unique bourbons yes. from whiskey lovers in our tribe, the people in the YouTube comments, the people in our whiskey tribe, whiskeytribe.com, they read the newsletter in the Facebook group. That's right. So these are people that know their way around to bourbon. We compiled the list. Yeah, we didn't just sit in here and pick them ourselves. We right. spent two weeks compiling suggestions. Okay, our first, and these are in no specific order. Our first we're gonna do is Jefferson. Yeah. Groth Cask Reserve. I don't know what a Groth is. Groth is a vineyard. Is, it, is there a... It's just a family name? It's the name of okay. the vineyard. Okay. Right? This is a Napa vineyard called Groth. So this Groth is a, Winery. a bourbon from wine country. Yeah, so Trey Zoller is uh, one of the founders of Jefferson. I'm, I keep going back to this because the smell is really amazing. Yeah. Um, and they started Jefferson's by sourcing everything. So they're, uh, they eventually signed a contract with one company to do their distilling, but over the years they sourced their whiskey from a bunch of different providers. Yeah. And then they would take that, they would pick it very carefully, then they would take that and they would finish it or age it in different unique ways. Mm. Right? Yeah. So they're sourcing, then finishing and aging. Now, um, no, so real quick, let me just say, in this you get the fact that this is all dark berry notes, because this was finished in yes. a uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. Yeah, so I'm getting the, the coolest note. I had the tiniest sip. I'll let you, I'm not gonna jump ahead. I'll let you get there. But Wh it's not as uh, sugary sweet on the nose as a lot of other bourbons. Yeah, yeah, it's not like the dessert wine finish. Now, I will tell you that just a normal wine, that's a risky thing to do. It's hard to get a good finish with just a non-dessert wine. A bourbon from wine country, man. That's dessert, I can tell you that. Now, it's, what he said was they took their whiskey. That is unique. They took the barrels from Napa, brought them to Kentucky, filled them, and then they stuck them in a hot box, which is a steel ship, like a shipping container, basically. Right. Right? Uh, where in the summer, it gets up to like 120 degrees they, inside they, there. So they just the and they for, did it for 60 days. They just sweat all the wine out of the barrel into the... And he said when he first tried it after those 60 days, it just tasted like wine. Yeah. With a little bit of a bourbon finish. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and so then they took them and they just sat on it and left it and let it mix. And so it is very dessert esque. Yeah, now the, the wine notes aren't subtle. They're not tame. They're definitely there. I am getting, and I'm, I'm glad to know the, the background because I'm getting a note that I only got from ice wine. Oh, yeah, that's that, right. When that, we did the ice wine finishes. Yeah, that really kind of condensed. Um, red grape that almost like is like a syrupy red grape almost. Yeah, mm. and yeah, it's it is dense. This does taste dense. It doesn't taste uh, to me. A lot of times, bourbon can have a thin middle, so um, and not always, but it can have a rich wood note base, and it can have really magical high notes. But very often, the mid range, as speaking as a musician, can be a little thin and. Uh, this so, is not that. This is this is definitely round and dense. Definitely unique. This actually, it, it's it's not unpleasant. It's definitely unique to me. This feels like a marriage of two things. That mm -hmm. it's uh, grape jelly and honey. And they are getting equal time. Grape jelly and honey. And they're not fighting with each other. They're, they're not fighting with each they're other. They're living in harmony. They're well, at the same Cats time. Cats and dogs though, living together. at the same time though. <laughs> nobody gets grape jelly. And pours honey all over it, and then just starts eating it by the spoon. What I do? Uh, really? No, I'm just kidding. Okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> so it works well, but yeah. it's not an obvious pairing that I think I'm going to be going back to time and time and time again. Definitely unique, though. And uh, 
one of the things that makes it kind of rare to find something truly unique in bourbon is the criteria that's required for something to legally be called bourbon. Yes, okay, so bourbon, and this is why I think it can be narrow, like Rex said, uh, it has to be at least 51% corn, has to be made in America, has to be aged in new oak barrels. Yes. Now, when your mash bill has to be dominant one grain, and has a specific barrel usage, right. you've instantly narrowed down a couple of big options yeah. for flavors. Yeah, right? yeah. Now, that's why people are starting to take a lot of advantage of the only thing they have left, which is finishing. Yes. Right? So now, a lot of bourbon snobs yeah. look at any kind of finish as flavored bourbons. We are not those people. No, 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 no. We are not this. If that's you, you're watching the wrong video. <laughs> because. I think every single whiskey on this back section, except for Law's Four Grain mm -hmm. and Maker's Forty Six, has a finish. Okay, that makes sense because if you, eight of the ten have a finish. You, if you're not taking advantage of the one thing you can play with, mm -hmm. then you're going to get kind of a predictable bourbon, enjoyable. Yes, and but, I think that speaks to the power of Law's Four Grain right. and Maker's Forty Six that they stand up as interesting even when surrounded by finished. Bourbons. No, absolutely. And uh, Ready I ready to move to the next one. Yes, I am. While you okay. get some glasses, I actually have a theory uh, that we're pretty certain about um, in regards to why bourbons often taste similar. The new oak uh, cask that has to, you know, um, age the bourbon. You often get kind of like um, a tannin, bitter, maybe a little bit of a sour note in there. And if you're able to use um, used barrels then all of a sudden you can't be called bourbon, but we have tried some things that are basically bourbon, but they were aged in used barrels, and it is just mind-blowing how different it can be. So the An new example of that would be American, uh, Michter's American Whiskey. Michter's American Whiskey is vanilla and raspberry and cherry, and it's glorious, but it's not a bourbon. And if you want to find that kind of thing, then go get some corn whiskey, uh, because very often corn whiskey is aged in used oak, mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to be 100% corn, it just has to be more than 80% corn. Right. And so you can get an example of that subtle, really more mellow, so, I like mellow corn, for example. So this is... Hey, of course we had to do Angel's Envy. It's a huge fan favorite, man. Yeah, and they're using at least six-year-old bourbon, usually. Angel's right. Envy, right? Right. Now, remember, this is Lincoln Henderson, like one of the granddaddies of kick-ass bourbon, right? He was um, responsible f at Brown Foreman for Woodford Reserve, Gentleman Jack, mm -hmm. among others, mm -hmm. right? When he retired... He had all of these ideas. He used to keep them in a little black book. Right. And all these ideas of things he really wanted to do. But he can't because his and job so he's, dictated. Right, his yeah. job was like, well, you have all these lines to create, my friend. So he joined with his son, Wes, and I they created their own this. brand. Smell this whole And thing. they sourced whiskeys right. and then finished these in port barrels for between... It's 8 to 12 bar uh, barrels at a time, they usually said. Mm -hmm. I don't know how long they spent in uh, port. Right. So the difference between... You can smell the port. So, uh, well, I, I, I'm going to taste this and then I'll ask the question because okay. I can't wait any longer. I know, it's so good. Damn it. It's so... This list, man, um, I tried all of these before we did the videos yeah. yesterday. This list almost is converting me to bourbon. Remember, you're watching a video with two guys who prefer scotch. Scotch and Irish and, and Japanese. Irish and, yes, and so <laughs> bourbon is not our home turf. And that's why we but wanted my, to do... My God. Yes. <laughs> I'm excited. This is a good list. I, well, I just about uh, half the things on the list I've tried, and it's like, well, damn, you're right. Those those are magnificent. Those are unique. Um, now, this, what this kind is of much lighter? Okay, much lighter than the Groff thing we just did. It's not condensed, saturated honey and, and this syrupy is sweet, red grapes. Yeah, but you're right. It's not as dense. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's sweet and like a light honey. What's the difference in... Okay, so this is 43. What was the... Mm. 45. Okay. Almost so, we're like going to say this a couple of times in the video, but keep in mind as you watch this, our preferences and our taste notes are going to be vastly different than yours because we're going to be drinking all these in an order. Yeah. And what you just had will absolutely affect what you tasted before that. Now, also, you're not seeing it on camera, but we are drinking water. <laughs> and we are cleansing our palate and doing stuff like that. But editing! Editing! Because if we spend, you know, two minutes of this video with you watching us drink water, that's no fun. You, uh, what's the best palate cleanser? Another whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so you, this was in a what finish? A port finish? Mm -hmm. All right. So what, ruby port. What elements are we getting from the ruby port? Do you think? Now I'm getting all the same kind of berry notes, but they're lighter berries, not mm -hmm. the darker. I almost get like a watered down green apple on the end there. Yeah, I was gonna say this is actually the smell on this right now. If I didn't know what it was, it would uh, lean into the Irish whiskey category with the buttery mm -hmm. kind of green apple notes. Mm -hmm. Light, friendly, clean. You ever have uh, an apple pie with green apples instead of red a uh, red apples? Maybe. Um, it's a little more tart. Just a little bit of that barrel note in there. Just a little bit of weird. yeah, but you get a Just lot of the yeah, bready notes. A little tartness in there. Bring me my bird. Next, please. Unique and delicious. In oh, there. Joseph Magnus. I'm excited about this. So here's what's funny. There are three bourbon companies that I have really fallen in love with. Never had this. For being really interesting. Yeah. And then I went and hung out with Nancy Fraley Fit at the this. Iron Root Republic Distillery in North Texas. Yeah. And found out she is involved in all three of those distilleries. <laughs> <laughs> so I found the common thread yeah. between three of my favorite bourbon distilleries and that common thread was Nancy Fraley. Mm -hmm. So um, who is Nancy? What is she? Nancy is known as the nose in the industry. She is an expert on aging and finishing and blending. Yeah. Uh, if, with a focus in American whiskey. Okay, so this is I'm getting bourbon. A lot, a lot more wood out of this. Right? This is DC, right? So this is a sourced bourbon originally. Mm -hmm. And then they finish them in Oloroso sherry, Pedro Menez, right. and cognac casks. Okay. Did, not all together in three. Different. Oh. Right? Right, right. And then they mix these things together to create an interesting flavor profile. Okay. Now this, I get all the same dark fruit notes, mm -hmm. but I also get sort of an orange note in there. Yes, that's what it was. Thank you. That is like a. Like, this is the first one of the three that combines berries with citrus. Yes, and it's not orange peel as much. Not for me. It's not orange juice, but the smell of oranges. That's really nice. Yeah, smell. before you peel them, when they're just sitting in the yes. bowl on the counter. Yes, yes. And it's not cutting into the peel and getting that sharp no. aromatic oil. It's too subtle for that. Yeah. Mm, gosh, it's really Now nice. look, they only did two inaugural runs and sold out instantly. Yeah. I got this because of Joe and Kate Van Name. Yeah, yeah. They sent this to us. Nice. And uh, this is not a cheap whiskey. This so, is at least a hundred bucks. You mentioned that originally this was sourced. Mm-hmm. Okay. I think it still is. Right. I'm not entirely certain on that, so don't quote me. So if you're fairly new to whiskey, here's one of the things you're oh, often yeah, yeah. you're often going to run into in whiskeydom. Uh, a lot of whiskey snobs rage oh. against people sourcing things and putting it in a bottle, and they think, "Oh, that's a travesty," and it can be shady. As shit. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, when I'm going to qualify that in a second. Yeah, yeah. When, when people like are sourcing stuff and calling it their own and heritage. That's bull. 200 year old family recipe, no, 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 no. That's crap. Yeah. But uh, sourcing, if done well, can make some amazing, wonderful, fantastic whiskeys. And there are tons of whiskeys that we can go to and, and that we can point to that would not exist if certain elements weren't sourced from uh, um, distilleries bringing their unique uh, flavor profile into that process. There are two kinds of people that in this whole sourcing ar argument. Uh, on the downside of it, right? Mm -hmm. There are the people who are mad because you didn't make it. Mm -hmm. And then there are people who have a problem with people pretending to have made things. Right. We're fine with those people, right? The people who are just pissed off at deceptive trade practices, yeah, that, we agree. Yeah, it's shut right? The people who are mad because you didn't make it yourself, f those people. <laughs> <laughs> they do not understand the whole history of bourbon dating back to the early days of making whiskey yeah. was more than half of the brands, even in the 1800s and early 1900s, were being sourced and renamed. Right. It, it's just extremely limiting mm -hmm. if you're making a whiskey and you could only use the things that happen under that one roof. It's like, man, if you're just trying to make something magnificent, why not use all the tools at your disposal? Yeah. In Scotch, uh, compass box is another one. In Scotch, compass box sources, yeah. yeah. So no, there's there's no problem with sourcing, there's just a problem with not telling people you're sourcing. Absolutely. Right, so if you're upfront about what you're getting and where you're getting it from, then that's just called creativity. <laughs> And, and it's all I care about, and all we care about, and all our tribe cares about is... Is it amazing? Does it taste good? <laughs> yes. That's it. <laughs> if it tastes good, mm -hmm. and they're not pretending to be something they're not, right. who gives a shit how they got there? 
This, for me, I'm getting more of a wood note than any of the others we've tried so far. Okay, I will tell you, this is the most mild of the three aged, mm. which is interesting because it has multiple casks. Well, hold on. It, and by mild, I mean it's it doesn't envelop the whole palate. Right. It kind of sits lower. Yes. Because if you were to mean mild in terms of lighter and brighter, mm -mm. it would have been the one we just had. No, no, yes. This is a darker notes, mm -hmm. but it sits, it's like a low rider. <laughs> it sits low in the palate. It's actually a really dark whiskey too. Yeah. It sits low in the palate, almost like a dense coffee drink, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, the feeling you get from a latte where the milk kind of clings to your tongue. Yeah. I'm getting that kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. low riding, cling, oily. Dude, absolutely. Um, and, and I actually do get a little bit of a coffee note in here. Yeah. Um, uh, that's I, very surprising. I just mentioned the color. Another thing in the world of whiskey uh, is coloring. E150. In the U.S., that's actually illegal to do. Is that right? Yeah, you cannot color something and call it bourbon. It's caramel food coloring. Caramel food coloring. Yeah. Um, so, you can't do that in bourbon. So anytime you find a bourbon, mm -hmm. it has bourbon on the bottle and you see the coloring, that is the coloring that comes out of the wood. To me, the barrel that you're talking about shows up at the end of this whiskey. Really? Mm -hmm. it's, for me, it's throughout the whole thing. From beginning to end. It is. It's on the outside edges, mm -hmm. and then it's the only thing that lingers. So if you count to 10 after you swallow, right. it stays sweet. After you get past 10, the only thing left is a bitterness. This is like uh, a dark, rich honey <laughs> on top of wood with the tiniest bit of... Uh, Dude, citrus and sugar. You know we could drink all all of these we've done so far all day long. Yeah, there's it's I'm I'm not disappointed yet. <laughs> and I do like the fact that this is no particular order because I think we would do a disservice to anything in the bottom half. The next one, oh, Laws Four Grain, our first non-flavor finished whiskey. Laws Four Grain. Now this is in Denver. Uh, this is uh, one of the guys who was involved in Stranahan's, if right. I remember correctly. Um, they moved into a Denver, historic Denver neighborhood and started making obsessive craft whiskey. And what I mean is, more than anybody on this table so far, yeah. these guys are, I mean, these are like the people who make one canoe every six months, <laughs> right? <laughs> Woodworkers who are like, yeah. when's your next canoe coming out? Uh, Fall. <laughs> How much does it cost? That's five thousand dollars. Right. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> now, there's two that, things. That's the the friends and family price. Yeah, they obsess over every step of the process. They do not cut corners. Right. They and because of that, they're smaller company. Sure. Right. Because you can't bulk that. This is the definition of craft. Yeah. Definition of the best of the best of craft, as you would prefer it to be thought of. Now, here's what I think is amazing about that. Yeah. For something that's that small of a release and that's that obsessed with quality, they're surprisingly affordable. Really? That you would expect something with that level of obsession yeah, yeah. to be, you know, hundred dollars, hundred and fifty dollars a bottle. Sure. No, no. What half, is it? half that. Really? Yeah, in fifty to hundred. I mean, even, even cheaper depending on which one you're getting. Now on where you get so it. So question, is this uh, the my only experience with laws where some whiskey is brought by one of your sommeliers? Mm-hmm. Uh, this was, is one of them. Who who was this? That was Dina, Anthony Dina. Anthony Dina. Anthony Dina brought us this. Yes, and Anthony Dina brought uh, several other laws, which every single one I've tried so far was amazing. This is, uh, they mill their own grains, mm -hmm. mix their own grains, mash them, open air fermentation. Okay, so. Which means you're allowing maybe some of the Little bacterias in the air to contribute to the yeast profile. The funky bits. Yeah. The funky bits. Vendome made their copper stills. Man. They moved them into American white oak barrels that age at least two years. Now this is corn, barley, wheat, and rye. You know what I'm not getting from these uh, unique bourbons that we've tried so far? It's not the predictable um, apple and cher cherry and honey. Yeah. That I get from almost every other bourbon. Yeah, exactly. Apple cherry honey. It's like, oh, bourbon, fine. But I'm not getting that predictable apple cherry honey. I am getting honey. a little honey, but you oh, know yeah, what's yeah. funny is no, I am no, no. getting it over granola. I'm talking about the specific combination of those things. Yes. A bourbon, traditionally, to me, I totally agree. is apple cherry honey. Uh, this, I'll get elements of honey, I'll get a, a green apple bit in another one. This is reminding me of when you go to like Whole Foods or something and get one of those granola things with yogurt, oh, and then they have a little packet of honey you can pour over granola. it. It's granola. It's granola with honey. Dude, that's it, you nailed it. So, um... Honey and like a black tea smell. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably the rye's contribution. 
You know what their motto is? Oh, Remember how I on. said they're all serious about it? Oh, come on. Their motto is craft over commodity, quality over quantity, whiskey above all. Yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. I sound like our people. Ours is almost that good. Ours is give us your damn money. <laughs> <laughs> and we keep it over the top of our distillery entrance. <laughs> And it has a trademark symbol next to it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the black tea note I was getting on the nose, for me, it absolutely shows up on the taste. Oh, yeah. This is the first time I've ever gotten that kind of dramatic black tea flavor from anything other than Wyoming. Yes. Whiskey. Oh. Eh. Nah. Yeah, yeah. Foreshadowing. Pace yourself. Foreshadowing. <laughs> mm. Okay, That's so. Really nice. Um, on the faintest, faintest bit of cinnamon on the back end for me. So question about uh, aging versus finishing because this is the first one that hasn't been finished in some funky way. Yep. Uh, and to be bourbon it has to be aged in new oak to mm -hmm. be called a bourbon. Right. But after it's been aged in new oak then it can be tr finished in a different kind of barrel? It can, yeah. So okay, can it be aged? Now if you finish it in another kind of barrel you actually have to apply for a recipe change. Okay. A uh, formula change. But it can still be called bourbon. But it has to be, it has to say it. Actually, no, technically no. So, for example, is Angel's Envy bourbon? Yeah. It starts as bourbon. Yeah. But notice that it says right here, Bur Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey finished in port wine barrels. Uh, that is not something they put on there to help you. Okay. That's something the federal government made them put on there. So anything you do outside the parameters of bourbon, mm -hmm. and you still want to say anything bourbon. Anything you finish, it needs to say what you did to it, right? Okay, so they can't just call it uh, Angels and be Bourbon, period. Right. No, they have to say they applied for a formula approved by the TTB, yeah. which is a formula where the description of the product is Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey Finished in Port Wine Barrels. You get approved, that has to go on the front of the bottle. This is so good though. Yeah. Here's the thing, of all of these, I love all of them. I love all of them. Yeah. But I think as a, just a generic, bur as a bourbon, non-finished bourbon, non -finished, just I would drink this as the only bourbon I ever got to drink again, I would be happy with that. One of the things to keep in mind whenever you're trying whiskey, uh, your mileage may vary mm -hmm. wildly. Y your experience is going to change based on what you just ate, what you just drank. Absolutely. Um, even kind of time of day can change how. As a matter of fact, we're probably giving these unfair reviews because we've had other things before them. Yeah. In weird order. If we wanted to be fair, we would do one at a time. Right. One of the more interesting things, one of the more fun things about whiskey is if you try something and you adore it. Well, you're probably going to need to try it several more times before you actually know that is just your soulmate whiskey. Uh, because we've tried things that it's life-changing. And then we circle back a few weeks later and it's like, oh my god, what is, <laughs> this is not amazing. Not great, yeah. And then things that we've tried that are just, you know, not, this is... Can move the angels in me so it doesn't Really not interesting, nose. really not fun, really not cool. We give it another shot on a different day and it is phenomenal. So try it a few times, a few different ways. Um, and now we're back into the super aged, no, no. not super aged, but the kind of musty bourbons. Oh, and, and quickly before we move on, one of the things that really can change up a whiskey for you to explore it, mm -hmm. um, add a little bit of water. Uh, but we did a video on our other channel, Whiskey Biscuits, about mm -hmm. the how, how, when, and why to add water to whiskey. We'll link it up here. Absolutely. Um, also, chilling whiskey is another thing you can do to yes. really switch it up, change up the flavors, and see how you like best to drink whiskey. And we'll link that one right up here. George T. Stagg. Okay, so George T. Stagg is another non-finished, but interesting, I think, and complex. It's sort of the the top dog of the Buffalo Trace Antique collection. I just sipped. I went right for it. I know, right? Just right for it. Okay, so uh, now this, it comes out periodically. It's expensive. It can be over 200 bucks if the retailer really wants to charge for it. Damn. Um, and it can be hard to get your hands on, so sorry yeah. about that. This, this, now the story... The distilleries don't have control over that, by the no, way. No, no, yeah. Distillery does not control what the retailer charges in America. Yeah, at all. Um, so, one of the grand founding fathers of Buffalo, of what's now today is Buffalo Trace. Yeah. 1878 in St. Louis, a whiskey salesman named George T. Stagg. George T. Stagg. He used to... And, now, and this is funny, because back then, this is an era when whiskey was super shady. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because this is... Yeah, um, I, what's the name for them? The guys, the drummers. They were called drummers. And their job was to travel around selling barrels of whiskey. Right? Yeah. And so they would have a barrel, and they would let their bar owners sample it 
And the bronze was like, yeah, I want that. And then they would ship them something. Right. Right? It may or may not be the thing they tried. Right. And not only that, but all the drummers were competing with each other. And it's notorious for them to spike each other's barrels by, like, actually spiking it and pouring whiskey out oh. of the ground. They had no whiskey left. Oh. Or pouring, like, acid or soap or other things into other guys' barrels to f*** with them. Yeah. Um, they would water them down. Uh, and actually, even actual salesmen would let you try something amazing, like, great. And then when they sent you the barrel, they would have refilled it with water to make it full, to make it last longer and charge you more. Right. <laughs> I mean, all kinds of shady shit was going on. And, and so, so, in that tradition, George T. Smith. Yeah, no, that's why we ended up with all of the Pure Food and Drug Act and all of the whiskey laws. So back there was called the Old Fire Copper Distillery from E.H. Taylor Jr. What's the proof on this? This is this high. Is, this is 64% yeah. alcohol. Man. This, but how smooth for a high proof whiskey. Bourbons don't often get higher than that. No. <laughs> that is potent. <laughs> so in 1904, it was rebranded as the George T. Stag Distillery. Okay. Which it carried for almost 100 years. Gosh, so again, it's, it's like the flavors that we've had before. And to me, this is probably, this is weird to say, this is probably the closest I have smelled to just a classic bourbon of the apple, the wood, uh, the cherry, but at 64%, you say, yeah. it's just so amped up and concentrated. It is. It's aggressive. It's another level, man. This now, here's what I've learned. Adding water to this, no, it ruins it. We did a video on this, oh, okay. and we added water. And it got boring and predictable. George T. Stag. Now, was it the George T. Stag or the Stag Junior? We did both. We did both. Oh, uh, uh, I think we made. I the think we. I know we did Junior. Okay. I thought we did the Stag too, but uh, if I'm wrong about that, I don't know. I'm sure people will tell me. You're just drunk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you could see the whiskeys we haven't consumed yet, uh, at this point, Rex and I have had about one ounce of whiskey. No. We're drunk. Yeah. <laughs> if it makes the video more fun for you, we're drunk. <laughs> okay. So, are you getting anything? No, I'm just, this is the I, most stereotypical bourbon flavor of the lot so far. But, uh, taken to 11. Mm -hmm. I think what makes this unique, and why I think, okay, I think it deserves to be on the list, <laughs> is because it is traditional bourbon flavors, but just cranked up to 11. This bourbon played drums in Spinal Tap. So, this is... That's all you can say about this one is, whoa! Just yeah, 64% alcohol. <laughs> um, this is not just a relaxed, comfortable sipper while you watch a no, movie. No, this is mineral water with a lot of cherry tobacco and yep. spices and uh, high alcohol content. It, it's kind of burny. Right. This is the kind of whiskey that you and your, your friends gather around and just focus on that. This may be a camping whiskey. Yeah, this is the one that's the hero. It's going to get everybody's attention. If yeah, you start with this and then you move to something else because <laughs> your palate will be blown mm -hmm. and it makes me a little nervous right now. Mm -hmm. All right, we're moving to Bell Mead. Bell Mead, just straight up Bell Mead? Bell Mead is Nelson Breyer Distillery uh, and Bell Mead, they have two brands. Uh, Bell Mead was the brand they started sourcing whiskeys yeah. and Nelson Breyer is them making their own stuff. I loved Bell Mead. When I first encountered them, I thought the original Bell Mead, right? Uh, this is just a magnificent bourbon. It's a sourced bourbon. Yeah. Right? And at the time they were sourcing it and hand choosing their casks and everything. This is that sourced whiskey finished in Madeira casks. Madeira. What is Madeira? Madeira. What is Madeira? Let me pour it for you. You can smell it while I'm talking about it. Mm -hmm. Good man. It'll make you feel better. Deep down mm. on the inside. I care about my feelings. Okay, so Madeira is a Portuguese fortified wine. Mm -hmm. Portuguese fortified wine. Okay, so... Now, and from, why? The Madeira Islands. Portuguese fortified wine. Madeira Islands off the coast of Morocco. Follow-up question. What is fortified wine? It's wine with other spirits added to it. Okay. To make it more alcoholic. So just wine, but then you're adding some alcohol bits to it mm -hmm. to crank it up. Fortified wine, Madeira. Fortified, basically given more muscle. Yeah. Made more alcoholic. Right? It's, uh, now, traditionally. Wine, wine with a sack. Traditionally, why did they do that? Because wine can spoil. Oh. But a higher proof 
Oh. Will take longer to spoil. I didn't or know it was a tradition spoil. thing. It was, yeah. So what happened was they would ship these wines off the islands. Yeah. To other places. Sure. But they could spoil in route with the hot sun yeah, on yeah. the ship decks or an under ship, right? And so they would add uh, fortified. They would add spirits to it to raise the alcohol content to keep them spoiling. Right. And now you have Madeira, right? And it would on these ship journeys, it would be rocked. And now uh, sometimes they will age these things by intentionally rocking barrels and adding fortified spirits. So I I don't know if I am able to give this selection enough due credit because I don't have a Madeira reference point. No, actually, oh, so here's a side tip. I'm just getting... If you really want to get nerdy about finished whiskeys, yeah. you need to get familiar with the things they're using to finish. Okay. So go to a restaurant and order a flight of sherries. Go to a restaurant and order some different kinds of, buy some bottles of port, Ruby and Tawny, mm -hmm. although Tawny's almost never used in finishing. Um, try all the things. Right. And what I found was if you get familiar with sherry, for example, yeah. you can spot a whiskey finished in sherry. You can tell which sherry hmm. if you know the sherries. Okay. Right? You can pick up a glass and they say, this is a sherry finished whiskey. You can pick it up and go, oh, Oloroso mm. all day long. Or, oh, that's Pedro Jimenez <laughs> yeah. all day long. Huh. Right? You can absolutely spot the kind of sherry finish. So specifically what's in this bottle. Yes. This smells lovely, this smells wonderful, this smells like bourbon. It does smell like bourbon, which I think is a good thing, because no, too, it's, it's not a bad too thing. often the finish obscures the spirit. Okay. So you're looking for just an accent. Yes, you want an accent, Not I something think. that just makes Now, it... this is a mix of six to nine year old whiskeys. Okay. And then finished in Madeira. So the nose is very traditional, the taste. This is something special. Now the taste is wow. different. The taste is different than anything we've tried up wow. until now. I really like that. Yeah. It's weird, man. Right? What it the? is weird. Now they have a cognac finish, they have a sherry finish, which I think is Oloroso. Yeah. And then they have a Madeira. I chose the Madeira because I think it's most interesting. We had a lot of people Wait a minute, hold on, shut your face. You chose? Well, we had a lot of people request a Belmede wine finish. Okay. But there's four. And the opinions were all over the map with those four. Right. So you made an executive so decision. So I made an executive decision to pick the Madeira of the all options. Right. So crowdsourced by whiskey lovers, except for a, an executive decision there. Yeah. <laughs> now, one of my favorite reviews was on Whiskey Wash. Mm. And his thought at the end, he said, it was kind of like a spirit mullet. <laughs> I haven't even heard the reasoning why. Because it had I one just, it had one thing up front oh. and a whole other thing after you're finished. He's not wrong. <laughs> you're saying this right as right as I'm up front and then I get to the finish and Yes. And that was I uh, not 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 very different. Watch. Sorry. That was Bourbon Guy. If you go look up Bourbon Guy. When he reviewed this one, right. he said it was a whiskey mullet, and I laughed out loud at my computer because that was so accurate. This is... It was so accurate. Funky and good and weird and fun, man. I like that. Th this you drink to explore, not just enjoy. Real good. Real good. <laughs> Real good. Okay, we're about to do another Jefferson. All right. Why are we doing a second Jefferson when we only had 10 to choose from, uh, Rex? You know what? It was super unique and y'all voted it up and I would not let Daniel take it off just because it was Jefferson. I tried to take it off because I didn't want two Jeffersons hey, in the list. Hey, hey, hey. The people have spoken. <laughs> now, I am going to tell a Jefferson story that I think is hilarious, especially is if you know your history. Jefferson's aged at sea? Yeah. Okay. So what happened was uh, Trey wanted to do a... Um, Experiment. Yeah. What happens if you take whiskey barrels and put them on a ship going out to sea? Yeah. And he had a friend who had a ship. And so they put some barrels on the ship and the ship just cruised around for mm -hmm. a while. Yeah. And when they came back, it really did make a difference. Yeah. And it was so good, they decided this is now a new thing we need to do. Yes. And so they're uh, now they are sourcing whiskeys, they're putting them in barrels, they put them on a ship, and traditionally, it crisscrosses the equator oh. and hits around over 30 ports every trip yeah. before they make it back to being bottled. Dan, so I have had this a few times before, and it actually is one of my absolute favorite bourbons. Not only for like the cool thing where they're aging it on the ocean, which is fun, uh, but the fact that it's just kind of great and amazing. And I don't know if it's because of the story, mm -hmm. 
That, of course it is. I don't know if you've got that's got to contribute. Uh, but uh, we're human. Fine, fine, we're only human. Fine, maybe. But I feel like and I can absolutely get that extra bit of salt. Of salt note from the sea air. So for those of you who are truly nerding out, this is batch four. Oh man. Okay, so um, so this is like in the here. Top. Why I like this is because this is how uh, alcohol, wine, whiskey, everything. Yeah. Originally made its trips. Yes, this is top over two. the ocean. So far, top two for me. Go ahead. Really? Yeah. Oh, I love this. Really? This is absolutely one of my favorite bourbons. No wonder you wanted it on the list. Uh, this is why I'm helping you people, because I was like, oh, it's Jeffersons. We can't have two. Jeff you eat it. You're right. There is. Salt it's in amazing. There. It's really, it's, it's unique. so much better than the Groth it, version. It defines unique. Okay, I'm gonna give Trey some and his father really quick. Mm. Go but all in good natured fun. They named it Jefferson's. Why? And this is my favorite quote ever from a marketer. He said, We have no connection to Jefferson's. We just wanted to attach our whiskey brand to a name that had historic significance. <laughs> I like him more. You shady son of a. <laughs> they mooch. They mooch to presidential history. Now, here's the funniest thing ever. Oh, that's good. Uh, Jefferson yeah. hated whiskey. <laughs> now, this is actually true. Go look this up. Jefferson was a wine snob <laughs> right. who thought that whiskey yeah. was the drink of the unwashed <laughs> plebeian masses. He thought only redneck idiots right. and drink whiskey. Right. Wine is the drink for people who matter. Hold on. I love Jefferson. Jefferson's wonderful, very smart no, he's man. He's my favorite president. Very smart man, contributed a lot to the country. Wine is what bankrupted this motherfucker. Ah, it's true! <laughs> he bought so much wine. He brought it back from France. He never got out of debt. When <laughs> he died, he was still in wine debt. Tremendous <laughs> amounts of wine. So I think he may have had a bit of a wine problem. Yeah, I take think his, so. Take his whiskey opinion with a grain of salt. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. Okay, so let's give some notes on this because it is deserving of a place in the unique bourbon list. No, no, it deserves it. Yeah. I The only reason I didn't want to include it because it was two Jeffersons in a list of ten. But it earned its way here. So uh, the salt note, yes, and, and I'm getting the same kind of black tea note, but it's a lighter black tea note than what we were getting before. I'm not getting the black You're tea. You're not getting the black tea? What are you getting? No, no, it's an Earl. No, it, oh, no, an Earl Grey is the perfect black tea. It, oh, it's. Um, no, I'm getting I'm more getting, of the dark caramel. Really, a dark? Yeah, I'm getting a dark caramel. Uh, I'm getting a, a dessert that has cherries in it, but that has sea salt. Wow, we are sea salt on top. We are on different ends of the spectrum. We really one. are. All right. Okay, so we're moving to Maker's Forty Six. This is our most. Okay. Common name Maker's other than stag in our list. Right, Maker's Mark. For what does the forty-six stand for? Okay, so I'll tell you the story of what happened. Right. So, um, Bill Samuels Jr. Mm -hmm. He's promoting Maker's Mark. Yeah. Right. And everyone's like, "Hey, we want to do something really new and interesting." And uh, he was like, "Bullshit! We're selling Makers. Screw you." Yeah. This is what we do. Um, he finally was like, okay, let's give it a try. And together he worked with uh, the master distiller, Kevin Smith. Mm -hmm. And they started with um, just a simple vision. It needed to be good. Real good. Yeah, real good. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, which means like it had to have the things that made you fall in love with makers. None of that weird barrel bitterness, uh, approachable, and so on, right? Yeah. Um, he wanted to take makers and have the makers intents just turned up. Sort okay. of like George T. Stag, sure. right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, he wanted it to have a longer finish, sure. Instead of the quick Maker's Mark bourbon. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So they decided to start with Maker's Mark, and then age it slightly differently. Okay. Right. N not instead of starting with a whole new right whiskey. What does forty six stand for? For well, what happened was. Uh, the first experiments just were horrible. <laughs> so they kept going. So then they changed to like, let's just start with Maker's Mark and do something different. And so they said, hey. Because we forgot how to make new whiskey. Yes. Let's go back to what we know and then tweak it. Just like ISC that. is the independent stave company. They're probably one of the largest barrel makers in America, if not the largest. Yeah. If you go to a distillery and they're using barrels, the 
odds are they're using ISC barrels. Okay. Maker's Mark was no different. Sure. They said, hey, we want these specific special barrels with different wood varieties, different chars, so each of the staves is different. Yeah. All in one barrel. Interesting. Right? Okay. And so they seared 10 virgin French oak staves, and then they mixed them with other staves, mm. right? Yeah. Now, the uh, barrel they made the ISC company internally named it the 46 recipe, Makers 46. Okay. Because that helped them know what they needed to create when they asked for more uh, barrels. So they just decided, okay, we'll sure. just call the whiskey Makers 46. So I have a couple of different questions. One is, these are oak staves. Mm -hmm. So it's- They're still new. They're still, still new, new still qualified as bourbon. Mm -hmm. One of the things you mentioned though, uh, was char. And if you're getting into whiskey, it's not like they just Holy put in crap. It's not like they just put in um, unaged alcohol into just a regular wood barrel. They actually char mm -hmm. the inside of the barrel, and you can char it at different different levels. Three is the most common. Two to four, you can go up to five. That's pretty serious. So depending on the kind of uh, the kind of whiskey that you're How going deep for, you char it. yeah, it, it, one of the things that you can tweak and adjust to you know result in something different in the end product is the char level. Based on everything we've tried so far, wait, 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 don't smell it yet. Maraschino cherries. Let me get it out. Me yeah, yeah, uh, get it out, get it out. <laughs> this just dominated my nose with maraschino cherries, Maras the dessert cherry. Maraschino cherry, it's the color. Don't look at the color. No, it's not the it's wax color. color. You're so easily manipulated. Now that I've lived with it a little bit more, the nose is coming back to barrels. Oh, no, I got the cherry, dude. Yeah, it's so strong. Oh, man, that's all kinds of good on the nose. Makers, I think there's going to be some people that are annoyed it's on the list because mm -hmm. Makers is just so big. I was like, eh, the big guys can't do anything unique, but... Those people should have been annoyed by George C. E. Stagg because that's from Buffalo Trace. Yeah. Hey, you the, can't get any bigger than that. The people have spoken. Yeah. And also, man, the flavor on this is pretty awesome. This is? I got to say, I prefer this to the classic Makers Mark. Oh, yeah. All right, so what's the next one? So... This is Wyoming Whiskey Incorporated. I'm already excited. I've had this. I remember the, the the video. You can do the video right here. We did a review. It's amazing. It's wonderful. Now Go here's ahead. the thing. I don't know if they're making this a regular, what? because they no longer have it on their website. What? So sorry about that. <laughs> but they're calling this the Wyoming Whiskey Double Cask. And guess who's helping them finish these? Nancy Fraley. Welcome to the Nancy Fraley episode. I know, right? <laughs> so. Uh, our memory of the original Wyoming whiskey, which is why it's one of our favorites, mm -hmm. starts with barrel tannin, yeah, thin middle, black tea, Earl Grey finish. Yeah. No eucalyptus. Wait, no eucalyptus? No, no. Black tea. Black tea? Right. Not legal, it's like the bullet. Like the now guy. this, they finish in sherry. Now like, Sam Mead- like bullet rye, not bourbon. Yeah, Sam Mead is the master distiller. Right. And Sam and Nancy, when they first tried this experiment, they left it in the sherry barrels too long and it ruined it. Mm. <laughs> it just destroyed it. <laughs> so the next time, they're like, okay, we should probably check this every week. And so they did and they ended up with what they bottled. Next time you need somebody right? to check it. Five years in bourbon. Yeah. Finished in a sherry cask for months. Months. Now keep in mind that Wyoming uh, is do we know, like, three months, nine months? Do we know? Have any idea? Uh, less than nine months. Less than nine yeah, months. Yeah, probably closer to three. Okay. Now, they're using Pedro Jimenez. Right. It is, which is even sweeter than Oloroso, so you got to be really careful with that. It is interesting to me how much a finish can really switch up a whiskey. Yeah. Because it's aged in, you know, bourbon. It's aged in new oak for years. Now we reviewed this whiskey separately on its own at one point. Right. And what we decided was that the sherry and the bourbon were both fighting for first place. Hmm. Yeah, I don't remember. I just remember loving it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. Damn. Come on. I'm getting more raisin I'm after getting... all the other stuff that we've been doing. Yeah. I'm getting more raisins. Oh. That is damn good. For me, uh, this, in terms of uniqueness, right, should top of the list for me. This is amazing. This is exceptional. The black tea note, absolutely. I'm getting some kind of spice that I wasn't getting before, and that's why I think. So, um, I think that like the Bellmead has a sherry cask finish, right? mm -hmm. 
and I think there's this older also. Um, but this is so much better because I think the whiskey it started with had these dark, complex notes yeah. instead of these cherry sweet notes. And, and so, and this is pure opinion you're about to hear, in a classic bourbon, you end up with honey and cherry, mm -hmm. right? When you add sherry to that, it just makes it even sweeter. Hmm. But the Wyoming whiskey started as barrel and black tea. Right. So it had these dark notes to start yes. with. So when you added sweetness to it later, it didn't, it, it it didn't ruin it. Sweet. Yeah. yeah, it just complemented it. Mm. And you can only do that if what you're starting with has some rich complexity. Man. This last one is uh, family of two of our level three whiskey small. Yeah, level, or they're level three? Yeah. Wow. Uh, I'm looking at your, I have, I'm cheating. Pritchard's. Pritchard's double chocolate. Yes. Interesting. So this is weird. Now, here's what I will say. I'm not sure how they got away with calling this bourbon because technically if you <laughs> flavor something, right. you're not supposed to be able to call it bourbon. But they started this back. In Who did you bribe, Pritchard? I know, right? <laughs> they started this back long enough that the craft whiskey finishing craze hadn't really started yet. Okay. They were one of the first people to do weird shit with bourbon. So they didn't get clamped down on. And so th I think people were like, okay. Are you grandfathered in? I don't know how they did it, but they did. Now, here's what's interesting. They're starting with a sourced four to six year old bourbon. Yeah. And then for about six months, they uh, take cocoa... Um, Husks. Cacao. Which are otherwise known as nibs. Cocoa nibs. Yeah, this is a family channel. This is an actual thing. This is a family channel. You can't talk about it. So basically the husk of the cocoa bean. The nibs. Is called the nib. And they take those nibs and they immerse them in the barrel. Okay. As it ages. Shut your mouth and pour me a glass. So you, you now remember, when the bummer about this is when you see chocolate. Double chocolate. You think sweet chocolate, right. Hershey's. No, 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 no. Or, you know. I don't do. Whatever. Milk, I don't do milk chocolate. I'm looking for like the bitter cacao note. Yes, exactly. If okay. you know cocoa, you know it's actually bitter yeah. until you add milk and sugar. No, I've never had this. I'm looking forward to it. This is super interesting. Oh, man. Right out of the gate. Unique all over the place. That this is nothing like anything that we drank so far. No, it's not. It's not. I I have to I have to recalibrate. <laughs> I have to recalibrate my uh, my brain for a minute because in terms of what yeah, I'm expecting too. from bourbon. Yeah, the thing is, this is on the line of what you do with gin. How where so? you fill a bag with all the herbs. Okay. Now there's two, there's a couple ways you can do gin. There's many ways you can do gin. You can either put all the herbs in the column as it distills, and mm -hmm. so the spirit goes through yeah. the packed spices. Yeah. Or you can actually set the herbs in the pot still, mm -hmm. and as it heats up, it marinates like a tea bag, and then it distills. Okay. Um, this is the process of this reminds me of what you would do with a gin, only they're doing it in the barrels instead of in the distillation process. That is so unique and weird and interesting and funky. Dude. And I'm getting that dark. Did you bitter, try the taste yet? Yeah, I'm still like the Dude. nose. The nose is so so different. I'm getting that uh, that bitter, dark chocolate note on the nose. Yep. And then some like uh, just plants. Yeah, and then some sap. Some is that it? Yeah, sap? it makes me wonder which barrels they're using, uh, or the uh, the whiskey they sourced. What barrels they were using? It could be a. It could be they were using kiln aged barrels. So, or I kiln dry. I gotta tell you, not at all boring or predictable on the taste. Mm -mm. But the nose for me is a funky adventure, mm -hmm. and there's no extra surprise on the taste. No, the taste matches the smell. Yeah, there's not anything as a unexpected fact, on As a matter taste. of fact, it's almost like the smell hints at what's about to happen, and then the taste goes, see? Yeah, it's like, oh yeah. It just delivers on the smell. Yeah, you knew where we were going. A little trivia note. Yeah. They're one of the only distilleries that gets to call their whiskey Tennessee whiskey. Recently, Tennessee. a Tennessee uh, politician mm. decided that he wanted to create a category specifying Tennessee whiskey. Mm -hmm. And it it said that if you don't use the charcoal filtering, then you're not a Tennessee whiskey. Well, Pritchard's already existed and they don't use charcoal filtering. So that law passed, yeah. much to the dismay of many people. Mm -hmm. And uh, Pritchard's got grandfathered in. Yeah. As we know you don't use this process. So the, I was joking when I said grandfathered. But you can still call yourself Tennessee whiskey. Can I talk about the finish on this for a second? Please. Because uh, initially, 
like the taste is okay the nose let me know exactly where we were going and we landed there and fine great weird unique different funky cool the finish for me is unmistakably the cacao bean the cocoa bean the chocolate that's the everything lands but that and it just keeps on going and it, it just on I buy that base, on that base level I buy that yeah all right dude that's it no it's not we did it no 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 we're wait we're, wait no no wait we just did it. We did 10 whiskeys. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the title of the video says 10 whiskeys. Plus, we usually do a bonus. Wait, wait, wait. What do you mean, we usually do a bonus? I am here <laughs> as a representative of... Who is this we you use? You have uh, a mouse in your pocket? I am here as a representative of the people. The people. <laughs> and uh, the people demand something, Daniel. <laughs> the people demand... You know, unique and interesting and weird and all that stuff is wonderful. They, de they demand... The most expensive whiskey <laughs> in the vault. Oh, the Mooch necklace is back. Dude, I haven't seen this for like three months. <laughs> I haven't seen it for three months. Well, I'm telling you to pull I out. I almost forgot you were a Mooch. I'm telling you to pull out the most expensive damn bourbon you have. Um, Go in that fancy cabinet that's off camera. I want dollars. I don't care about quality or uniqueness, whatever. Pull out the most expensive bourbon you have in this room right now, and I will sample it on behalf of the people. So, I haven't checked my spreadsheet. <laughs> well, then pull them all out, and but I will no, tell you which one tastes the most expensive. But I think I know which one is most expensive, because it's around five to $600 on the secondary market. So, we'll slum it. Fine. Uh, I'm in like a thousand dollar mood, but fine. Okay, well actually there's one that's even more expensive than that. And, really? But it's the, uh, uh... I don't know, but I'm betting this is more expensive than that one. Yeah? Even though that was 28 years no, old. No, that's the Fitzgerald? Yeah. That's thousand dollars. Yeah, is it? Or is it 1700 It might, I don't know. But it's probably more than 500 the most expensive bourbon, bring it to me now. Or, or the oldest. You want the, do you want the most expensive or the old, the oldest, Rex? Do you want the oldest bourbon? The only way for me to decide is for you to bring both. <laughs> nope. And I will choose. Nope. This is what I'm doing. Nope. This is what I'm doing. Nope. I'm being very fair and benevolent. What? You bring the both to me. This is the opposite of fair and benevolent. You bring the both to me. I will smell and choose. I think you need to do the mooch tasting technique of holding it. <laughs> Of holding it to your Where? head. Shut the f up and bring me no. some guts bottles. Where? You gotta hold it to your head. Why? Yeah. Because that's how you know. That's what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Hang on a second. Oh, my glass smells amazing. Oh, smell it had the PD whiskey in it. Smell that. That had Lafroy in it. Uh, okay, Whoop and Holler 28. Whoop and Holler 28. That's no, about no, five, six hundred dollars. Orphan Barrel, whatever that means. Yeah. Finest quality. It says 28 years. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Or the Fitzgerald 20 half bottle. <laughs> of which doesn't exist anymore. Okay. All right. Here we go. So, so which one, Rex? This is what I will allow you to do. I will close my eyes and choose based on the nose alone. Okay. Hold them up to me, Sam. Service me, Sam. All of a sudden, I really don't want to. Do it, Daniel. <laughs> Dude, you just can't. <laughs> That's Fuck the creepiest you know. thing. <laughs> ah! <laughs> All right, here you go. Oh, nice. All right, that's one. That's amazing. You know, I gotta go this. Really? I really do. On the nose, smell that. Okay. The nose is I get it. much more interesting on the whoop and holler. Okay. Interesting nose on the whoop and holler. Because this is In a that glass? Um, no, no. This is a video no. for uniqueness. I'm getting you a new glass. Okay, you get me a new glass. Ah, dude, really? <laughs> That's six hundred dollars a pour. You just poured some into your used Lafroy glass. That's such bullshit. Or did I find something magical? Yeah, right. Oh. Now here's what I'm. Uh, I didn't tell you this before. You really should have gone with a Fitzgerald twenty, because that Whip and Holler twenty eight. It spent too long in the barrel. It tastes like bitter barrel. Is that why it smells so weird and unique? Yes. It's actually not a bourbon that I like at all. It tastes like licking a piece of barrel. <laughs> Whereas the 20-year-old Fitzgerald is magical. That is 
Uh, wood on top of wood. Yeah. Yeah, it is. All right, uh, so if you guys want to uh, check out our other channel, it's Whiskey Biscuits. It's right up here. It's a lot more shenanigans. Yep. Um, and if you want to join the Whiskey Tribe, we actually have a newsletter, whiskeytribe.com. We do. All right. Here's to fighting, stealing, and drinking. If you fight, may you fight for a friend. If you steal, may you steal a lover's heart. If you drink, may, may you drink, drink with us. Hey, thanks for hanging out with us in the Whiskey Vault. Don't forget to throw in a like, hit that subscribe button on the bottom right, and drop a question or comment down below. 